I'm going to ask you to turn in the Gospel of Matthew to chapter 10. Turn or push buttons. Push buttons. You know, iPhones. Hmm? That's Siri, yeah. Matthew chapter 10. Would you stand with me, please? I want to give God's word the glory that it is due. Matthew, excuse me, chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Father, thank you for your word. And, O God, that you've given us your word that we might learn of you. You've given us your word, Lord, that you might speak to us, that we might know what you would have us know. Thank you for your spirit that opens up your word, that reveals your word to us. I know, Lord, your word is anointed. I pray for the anointing on the preaching of your word. And God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive. God, let us all be open to hear what you would say to us today. I pray, Lord, in all of it, we would look to you and that your name might be glorified. Let your will be done, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This is a pretty big world. I mean, if you were to traverse it, it's pretty big. If you've ever flown anywhere, you know it takes quite a long time to get someplace. If you were to walk it, you'd probably be at it for the rest of your life. We talk about how, you know, what a small world. We run into people that, you know, that know people that we know. Uh, you know, in another state or something. We say it's a small world. But in reality, as far as it relates to us as human beings, it's pretty big. And uh, there are some 7 billion people on the planet. 7 billion. That's a, that's a lot of people. Uh, it's been estimated that since the beginning of time, since creation, there have been 20 to 21 billion people that have ever lived. It's quite a lot of people. And in the mix of all that, in the, in the midst of seven billion people, in the mix, mix and midst of 21 billion people, we are. You sitting there this morning are, are one of the many, one of the multitude in this vast world and, should I say, vast universe. Did you ever wonder if God knows you? You ever wonder if God knew where you were and and who you were? You ever feel like Waldo? You've seen this before, right? Haven't you? There's... Where's Waldo? There's a whole bunch of puzzles. Where's Waldo? Uh, the whole idea here is that, you know, there's a bunch of people here. This, this happens to be, it, it appears to be a mall. And uh, in this mall, there are many people doing many things. There's some people down here uh, selling washing machines and dryers. And at the same time, this fellow's doing his own laundry in the middle of the mall. You got vacuum salesmen over here. Don't pay too much attention to the woman's dress being pulled off by the vacuum machine. (laughs) Uh, People falling, uh, a little child pushing an old man in a a baby carriage. We've got all kinds of things going on here in this picture. And if you look at the Where's Waldo puzzles, it's just that. There's a bunch of people doing a lot of stuff, ordinary stuff. And in this picture somewhere is Waldo. Waldo 
is not doing anything out of the ordinary. He's, he's not doing anything to attract attention. He's just like everybody else. He, 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 he's wearing a, a striped shirt and a hat. But, but in all reality, he's, he's just like the very many people. He, there's nothing to make him stand out. He, he's, he's just kind of lost in the crowd. And so... You ever feel like Waldo? Ever feel like you were just lost in the crowd? Like I'm just, I'm just going through the, I'm just existing. I'm in the, I'm in the midst of this great crowd of people. What does my life really mean? What is my life? What, what value is there to my life? If I should cease to exist today, would anybody care? If I weren't here this morning, would anybody even notice? Would, would it be just a, you know, a, a blip on the radar? Would it be just a bump in the road? You know, if I weren't here next week, you know, another pastor would come. If, if you weren't here next week, somebody else would fill your chair. What value is there to my life? Do, does, it even, does anybody even care? If, if I were to cease to exist, would the world even notice? Would anybody notice? What value is there to my, does anybody, does anybody even care? We feel like we're lost in the crowd. Jesus in this text is expressing, he's expressing to us God's care for his people. It's in the context of, uh, of providence. He's talking about providing, but, but the bigger picture is that, that he's, speak, he's speaking of God being aware of us. Yes, we see this great crowd of people, and, and we see people doing all kinds of things, and, but God sees Waldo. God sees the, the individual who would otherwise be lost in the crowd. God knows. Jesus here, he, he talks about sparrows, and he says this. He says, what value is there in a sparrow? What value is there of a little bird. He says two sparrows are sold for a farthing. Luke, in Luke's gospel, he says that five are sold for two farthings. I bet you want to know what a farthing is. Well, it's a one-tenth of a drachma. Another version says it's a penny. Two sparrows are sold for a penny. I mean, not much value, right, in a sparrow. If two could be sold for, for, a, for a penny. I mean, how many times have you seen the sky filled with sparrows? They're everywhere. In fact, well, not so much now because many of them go to warmer cli climates during the winter. But, you know, during the summer, during the spring, they're everywhere. You see them, you, you, you might see a thousand of them. Uh, on your way to church on a Sunday morning and not even notice because you're not looking for sparrows. They're everywhere, and so there's very little value. But if you ever sat down and, and, and in, with interest cared to look, you, you, would, see, you would see the sparrow, and, it, and you, you, would, you could actually see one out of many if you cared to look. But there's so many in so many places that we tend to think very little of sparrows. And yet, God who created the heavens and the earth created trillions of sparrows. And Jesus says not one of them, not one of them will fall on the ground without your father. Not one. Not one sparrow. Trillions of sparrows all over the world. They're very uh, common and, and we think nothing of them. But God's Jesus says not one will fall to the ground. Now I know this could be interpreted many ways. And, and most times we hear translated or interpreted this way. That, that a sparrow will not fall and die without, without your father being aware of it. And, and that, that is true. Indeed that's true. There's, there's an element of that. But... Look at the context in which Jesus is speaking. He, he's talking about providence. This word fall simply means to descend. Are you with me? 
It, it simply, it, the word simply means to descend. It, that not one sparrow will descend from the sky. Not one sparrow will descend to the ground without your heavenly Father being aware or being involved. Listen, um, it could mean that one, not one sparrow will land upon the ground aside from the Father's knowledge or care. Luke says, not one of them is forgotten. Not one sparrow will be forgotten without your Father being aware. Matthew 6.26 says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. You get the picture? What value is there to a sparrow? They don't sow seed. They don't, they don't gather seed. They don't work. They do nothing but... I don't know what they do. You could buy two of them for a penny, and yet not one of them does anything without your heavenly Father being very much aware. He's provided a place for them to land. He's provided food for them to eat. He's provided shelter for them to sleep in. And our heavenly Father is aware of everything that has to do with every single sparrow. Although there are trillions, God knows each and every one intimately, and he's provided for them. I don't know. I, I like to feed birds. I mean, I'm not a bird feeder. You know, I don't have bird feeders all over my house. But, um, but I like, you're sitting there having lunch outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're sitting there having lunch outside, and a bird, you see a bird, and you, you toss them a piece of your bread, a piece of your... I love doing that. You know why? Because I have this, this understanding at that moment that I am in the very center of the will of God when I'm feeding this little bird. Think about it. Amen. Not one of those little sparrows will, will, will land on the ground without your heavenly Father knowing He has provided for every little sparrow. And if I'm feeding the birds, I'm in the center of God's will. Amen. You say, you're nuts, Pastor. <laughs> Indeed I am. But that's how we need to think. That, that we are, what is God's will for us? And how should we live? What am I doing at this very moment? And what would God have me do? And if we live that way, friends, we will be mindful of his mindfulness of us. And we will be in the center of God's will. Not one sparrow does God not take interest in. Interest in. Why does God care for sparrows? If there's so many of them, if there's so many everywhere you go, sparrows galore. And they're two could be bought for a penny. They're, they're cheap and they're, they're, they're in, in the multitude. Why does God care about one single sparrow? Because they're his. Because he created them for a purpose. They weren't some, uh, you know, ancient uh, protoplasma sparrow slime that floated on a pond somewhere and decided to grow wings and fly. They, they didn't evolve out of some goo. They were created by God for a purpose. They are His. And because they are His, He cares for them. Although we would seem, uh, they would seem so insignificant to us, but they are, they are His and therefore God values them Greatly. He created them for a purpose. Now, unfortunately, I have to tell you that in biblical days, they were often used for food. Why would you buy a sparrow? Why would you buy two for a penny? Because they were used for food. They would, sparrows would often fall, uh, get caught in the snare of the fowler. If you ever remember reading that in Scripture, the fowler's snare. They would be caught by the fowler and they would be sold for food. But something about sparrows, I, I love to hear them sing. I hate the winter. I, I love the spring and I love the summer. When you wake up in the morning and you hear the birds singing, all the different kinds of birds, who's that's beautiful. Who, we, got, we have birds here today. Bring it. Bring it all day. I'll, I love the sound of birds. And you ask my family. They know. I'm nuts. I love to wake up and hear the birds 
chirping. Sparrows, they don't, they don't sing pretty songs. They just, just kind of chirp, chirp. But when there's many of them, it's be I love to hear it. It brings joy. I have joy in my heart when I hear a sparrow sing. You say, well, they, they have no value. They're, they're cheap and they're, they're plenteous. And, uh, yeah. God's plan for the sparrow may seem minute to us when they're so cheap and so plentiful and they're eaten or all they do is chirp. They may, God's plan and purpose for the sparrow may seem minute, but he cares for each one all the same. He is intimately knowledgeable of every single thing that pertains to every single sparrow. God knows. He knows. And not one sparrow exists without God being intimately aware and caring for each. You with me? Jesus says that God cares about the sparrow. And then he, then he goes on to say, and you, how much value is there in your life? How valuable are you to God? I mean, there's 21 billion of us that have ever existed. There are 7 billion of us now. You're just one of 7 billion on this little speck. Whoops little speck floating around in, in the universe. You say, what value do I have? It, I'm, I'm like Waldo. Where am I in the crowd? Does, does anybody even see me? Does anybody care? Does God even know? What value do I have in the eyes of God? God Jesus said that God knows the number of hairs on our head. Now, I don't know, but the most loving parent I don't think has ever counted the hairs on their child's head. I mean, I love my kids. I've always loved my kids. Sometimes more times than others, but I've always loved my kids. And as, as they were children, I, you know, I cared for them. I changed their diapers. I, you know, I, everything. I've, I, I would dance with my children in the living room. Kenny G. I would... I would dance with my kids around. I would sing to them. I, I would hold them. I would rock them. I would love them. I would caress their heads. But it never dawned on me to count their hairs. I love them, but that wasn't... I, don't, I guess I didn't love them that much. But God does. He knows the number of hairs on each of our heads. Listen. It's not simply a matter of record keeping. God doesn't say, okay, well, Susie has, you know, 50,225. And it's not a matter of record keeping, although God can't help it. How, how could he not know the number of hairs on her head? Because he's omniscient. By default, he knows the number of hairs on her head because he knows everything. There is nothing that is that God doesn't know. And so he knows the number of hair, our hair simply by default. But much more than that, he knows the number of hairs on our head because he is intimately aware of everything that pertains to us. In the midst of this great crowd, in the midst of all these people, with all of their hair, God knows you so much, so intimately, that he knows the very number of hairs that exist on your head. How, how much God loves us. Well, maybe, maybe, you, you, maybe you don't feel that way. Maybe you'd say, you know, I don't feel like I'm valuable, that valuable anymore to anyone. Maybe it is that you're, you're here today and maybe you've raised your children. And, and when they were small, you, you changed their diapers and you warmed their bottles and you rocked them to sleep and you sung them lullabies and you cared for them and as they grew up you taught them how to ride their bicycles and you taught them how to brush their teeth and you taught them how to fix their hair and all of those other things but they're gone they, they're grown and they've moved on some of them have children of their own and 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 you say well they don't need me anymore well at least they don't think they do but they don't need me anymore what i don't 
I don't seem to have that purpose anymore. I wake up, but I don't have a, a baby crying for me. I don't have somebody who's, who's, who's saying mom or dad. Who, who, I, I don't have that anymore. What purpose do I have? I don't, I don't seem to have any reason, any purpose in my life. Maybe you're sitting here and that's how you feel. Maybe you're older and you've retired. You say, I used to be productive. I used to, you know, I used to produce a product. I used to produce a, I used to pr provide a service. My time was valuable to others. They called on me. I was important. I, I, but, but now I'm retired. That time has passed, and, and uh, I don't produce anything of any value anymore. I don't provide a service. I'm just, I wake up every day, and what purpose is there? Maybe you work in the, the cube farm, you know, the, the office. You got a cubicle. It's yours. But it's in the midst of many other cubicles. And you're just one. You're, you're, you're just one of many in, in, your, in your office. Maybe you're one of many in a factory. You're just, you're just one in the crowd. You, you say, I, I just, what value do I have? Who cares about me? Does God even, I feel like Waldo. I don't know what your scenario is. Maybe, maybe you're sick. You've been sick. You're not healthy and, and others have to care for you. And you feel like you're a burden to others because somebody's always having to care for you. You're not able to provide. You're not able to, to do what you used to do. And you, you feel like you're more of a burden to the world than a blessing. I don't know what your scenario is. But maybe, maybe you're just saying, how could there be any value in my life? My friend, if all you were worth was, a, was the price of a sparrow you would be incredibly valuable to God. Because not one sparrow exists without God being intimately aware of everything that pertains to the sparrow. But Jesus said, no, no. You are much more valuable than many sparrows. God knows you exactly. He knows you intimately. He knows everything that pertains to you, even the number of hairs on your head, as insignificant as that may sound, God knows you. He knows that as well. His intimate knowledge of you. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10, the Lord said, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Listen. Listen. According to what we do, God knows even what's in our heart. According to what we do, God knows what's in our heart. He knows what we do, but He knows why. He knows, he knows our thoughts, the Bible says, are far off. Before we even think a thought, God already knows what we're going to think. God knows us intimately. The same prophet, Jeremiah, through whom God said, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God says, I, I am well aware of your life. I know the thoughts, the plans that I have for you to bring you to, the, to a hope. I've got a hope. You, you've got a hope at the end. Jeremiah 23, 24, the Bible says, Can any... Hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. God says, I know exactly where you are. Are you with me? God says, I know exactly where you are. I know what you think. I know what you do. That should both thrill us and scare the life out of us. Scare the life out of us because... God knows. I said, God knows. We, we put on the, on the facade. We got dressed this morning. We fixed our hair. We put on our makeup. Well, some of you did. We, I didn't. But we put on the, the facade. We put on our church clothes, and we, we put on our church talk, and we put on our church face, and we come to church, and, and we're churchy. But God knows what's going on beyond the facade. God knows why we do what we do. That, 
that should scare us at times. Because we can't fool him. If, if he knows our thoughts before we think them, how could we hide ourselves from him? He knows why we do what we do. He knows what we think. We may fool one another. Not as much as you think. But we can't fool God. And so we ought to be careful then how we walk and what we think because God is watching and seeing and we're living in His presence. Listen, nothing we do is in secret. He sees all of those sins that we commit. Before you get freaked out, he knows every single sin that we commit. Oh, but hang on. I did say it should thrill us. Romans 5.20, the Apostle Paul says, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where our sin exists, God's grace surpasses our sin. God's grace is super abundantly uh, available above our sin. He knows our sin, yes, but he knows the plans that he has for us. Not only does he know what we are, but he knows what we will be. And he is intimately concerned about every aspect of our lives. He has a plan for our lives. Now I'm not going to tell you that that's a glorious, wonderful plan. Sometimes that plan hurts. But it's his good plan for us nonetheless. And all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his good purpose. He'll work out all the details and the end ultimately will be glorious. Are you still there? Amen. His thoughts toward us are always for our good and in our best interest. Do you believe that? Paul says, nevertheless... The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Like an inscription in the foundation stone stating who built it and for what purpose. The foundation of God standeth sure. The purpose that everyone that nameth the name of Christ would depart from iniquity. The builder is God. And the seal is the Lord knoweth them that are His. And He's promised to reward us. Are you still with me? Amen. He's promised to reward us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You could turn there if you want, but I'm not going to wait for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul, in essence, is saying we live and we die. We're living and we're going to die. And this flesh is going to put on unflesh. We're going to be resurrected. And so everything that we do, we should do for his glory. We should be mindful of the fact that he is aware of us and that we live for him. Therefore, my be beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He says, be ye steadfast. Keep on keeping on. Be strong. Be firm. Be confident in your faith. Don't be agitated or shaken by anything you see, hear, think, or feel. Don't, 
Don't let the world shake you up and get you off your foundation. Don't let the power of sin overtake you. Be unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always doing His will. Promoting His glory. Advancing His kingdom. Because you know by virtue of the truth of the gospel that your labor is not in vain. What you do is not in vain. It will be rewarded. Listen, this isn't all there is. This isn't all there is, friend. You say, well, I'm there somewhere. I'm Waldo. I'm in the middle of this. Everybody's doing stuff all around me. and I don't seem to have any value. I don't seem to have any purpose. I don't, does anybody even know I exist? Does God even care? And you look at yourself and you say, this, if this is all there is, but it's not. 70, 80 years, how long are you going to live? 90, 100? The Bible says it's a flash, it's a vapor, it appears and it's gone. And when it's over, all of eternity awaits you and God promises that he will reward you then for what you do now. Don't think that this is all there is. God is intimately aware of each one of us. He knows our lives. There'll be a resurrection and you'll be suitably recompensed, recompensed for your life here. So where's Waldo? Well, I'll tell you, Waldo's right there. But, but God knew. God knew all the time where Waldo was. In the midst of all of that, God knew. And God knows exactly where you are. In the midst of your life, in the midst of this crowd, God knows. You cannot hide in the crowd. God is aware. Nor can you be overlooked by an omniscient God. You can't be overlooked. You, God can't miss you if you try to hide. You can't. God can't overlook you. Your Father, your Creator, knows you intimately, inside and out. He knows you. Before the worlds were made, God had you in mind. He knows your every thought. He knows your every care. And he has plans for your life and for your reward. I, I'll finish with this. I would have been finished, but I was reminded of a, of a story in the Bible Brother Ron shared last week, the story of Joshua. Remember Joshua? He, he, needed, he needed time in battle. The sun was going down, and he wouldn't be able to fight. He wouldn't be able to win the victory. And he, and he said to the Lord, just give me a little more time. May, just make the sun stop in the sky. Yeah, that's going to happen. And it did. The Bible says that God caused the sun to stand still, and the moon stayed. So okay. That's pretty cool. Well, I studied the solar system, and I, I learned some things about the solar system. The gravitational pull on each of the planets, in the moon, and the, and the sun, everything is in the proper balance. Everything is in exact balance. If we we're any closer to the sun or any further away, we, we could not sustain life. Everything is perfect. What that tells me is not only did God stop the, and by the way, the sun didn't, doesn't move anyway. It's the earth that, so we know that. But not, God didn't just stop the earth from spinning. In order for everything to not crash into each other, God stopped the entire solar system because Joshua needed time. I, I believe that as the solar system is part of the universe, God stopped the entire universe for one person who prayed. And you may feel like Waldo. And you may think that you're just one of the crowd and God doesn't know who you are and where you are and your life might seem not to have any value. But God is so concerned about you as an individual. You're not, you're not just worth a sparrow. Your, your life is far superior and worth far more than many sparrows. God knows you intimately and has plans for your life. And if you'll just put your faith and trust in Him, 
He will guide you and He'll bring you to that expected end, to, the, to that hope that He has promised for each of us. I don't know who this message is for this morning. I'll tell you what, it was absolutely for me. It was absolutely for me and I believe it's for others. God loves you. You haven't gone unnoticed. You, you haven't been overlooked. Your value can't be measured in your comprehension. And God isn't going to leave you. He's going to bring you. If you'll put your trust in Him, He's going to bring you to that place and that plan that He has for you. I'm going to close in prayer this morning. I'm going to ask you to pray. And I, I'm going to ask you to pray this way. If, you, if, the, if this applies to you, say, Pastor, you, you must have been reading my mail. That's exactly how I feel. That's exactly how I've been feeling. God want, God's speaking to you today. I'm going to ask you to come and pray with me. Let me pray for you. God wants to encourage you. You step up. You, you come to Him and you, and you present yourself to Him and, and let, him, let Him speak to you. Let Him touch you. Let Him encourage you. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to come and pray. Let me pray with you.